my intentions in the color study PDF and all of these dozens of color study demonstration videos has been to make enough information both visual and verbal freely available so those with the drive and determination to understand through endless practice will be able to teach themselves how to study color and through their own unique experience of these ideas will come to their own profound understanding of the beauty of nature and the genius and depth of the old man's accomplishments. When we go out into nature to paint, we are not out to make a tree portrait, but a portrait of the light. This is just a little explanatory appendix to the elementary landscape demonstration. There are two extremely important aspects of landscape color study that Henshi called visual analysis and compositional editing, both of which are necessary even for the beginner if they are to understand why things are developed within a certain progression and not some other. To start, Henry said, we are not copyists, we are composers. Like poetry, painting is an arrangement of truths. An arrangement of truths that by design is meant to express certain qualities and or emotions about and towards one subject. And that arrangement conveys those visual truths in as a profound a way as one's abilities will allow. Being a copyist is exactly where most of us start our perceptual journey. But much like overcoloring, it is a stage we must outgrow if we are to progress perceptually. The idea of copying implies that the subject is stable and unchanging, which is never the case, and even if it were, as the great Hui Ning said, mind is moving. Perception is not a camera that registers and fixes all the supposed facts for all time. It very much participates in the flow of the change and is part of that perpetual motion. Even the act of observation itself changes the outcome and makeup of what is being observed. Just ask Heisenberg. So one can put on the visual straitjacket of the copyist mentality, or one can deal with the flow of change as each one's capacities will allow. Henry talked a lot about visual analysis, of understanding the three-dimensional quality of forms and the rhythmic relationships and movements of those forms. Also the subject's color, range, and depth, and especially the luminous quality of the light key, whether it was high, medium, or lower range of color intensities or brightness. That being the very first consideration, how is the subject lit? His point was to know what you are seeing before you reach for your paint. Only then will we have a good idea about pigment selection when one starts making the visual comparisons for the masses and later for any variations. As we explained in previous sessions, one through five of this group of videos, no matter how chaotic the landscape forms may appear, as Henry said, it's the painter's responsibility to quote, bring order to the picture plane, and that is done by eliminating all but the essential. It's not so much a simplification as it is an ability to see the large passages of light and shade without being distracted by or attracted to all the irrelevant details, and an ability to see only colored shapes in relation, one note laying next to another note and getting their relatedness in color as well as possible in the aggregate state of the masses. It's big seeing, even monumental seeing, seeing the majesty of nature in its briefest, most succinct terms. You'll play hell trying to revisit a leaf or a twig when you have begun to see and analyze in this way. So the short version is, start things in a state that cannot be reduced further. The fewest number of masses 
and the fewest number of shapes possible as analyzed from observational comparisons and see and understand them clearly before you reach for any paint. Closely associated with visual analysis is compositional editing. The first is a perceptual understanding, but this second one is a direct doing or undoing of things as observed, understanding the forms as solids with a top plane, a side plane, and an end plane, and editing out anything that does not help express the overall form of each mass or contradicts the forms or otherwise leads the eye out and away from the arrangement are all to be eliminated or expressed in a way that does not bring attention to itself, like mentally cropping errant twigs, clumps of extraneous foliage, excessive limb work, or overly complicated forms that are best expressed in an, in an abbreviated way or edited out altogether. This especially applies as one develops a work. Conventional material details are used sparingly just to enhance the focal area and must be part of how the light is expressed in the area or mass that it is a part of. The visual quality of the masses obviously governs light key refinement but also governs form modeling and other types of drawing and how they are utilized. No color can violate the relational state of the mass that it is a part of, nor can any type of drawing violate that mass's contribution to the light key of a work. Anything that draws attention away from the whole, from the unity of the light key, is out of key, whether it be a color or a shape or conventional or other drawing, and should be edited out. We are already down in the weeds, so let's go a little deeper. What others have referred to as broken color in Henchy works are actually minor, minor variations applied as final forms of drawing or accentuations. Each work has its own unique combination of drawing efforts and effects, especially areas like the borderland between tree and sky. As can be seen in his works, it's far more important for the edges of forms to turn away from the eye 
than to have distracting details where they don't improve the motif, view, or scene. He said there are many different types of drawing, but to use a type that best expresses the light in any area by colored shapes or colored marks rhythmically related to the flow of the light. As he explained, every light key requires a different type of drawing or a different combination of drawing based upon the requirements of what is necessary to express the light. Regardless of the materialism of the mind, what is being seen before us is light, and the function of drawing in color painting is to animate the movement of that light. The hierarchy of painting ideas are composition, color, and drawing in that order. Hence he understood that these were not three separate things where color was concerned, but were one and the same. Because what it comes down to is that we are modeling or drawing light, not material forms, and are to animate its, its movement. Movement which is not unlike water flowing over stones in a stream. Henry described this flow of light as large luminous spheres that seem to roll slowly through one's field of vision, altering one's perception of each area they pass through. And much of his personal technique through his highest period and beyond was an attempt to express those visions of the movement of light. As he explained in his late years, his intentions were to arrive at the form of light itself, a singularity, the ultimate refinement of perfected masses, one volume of luminous color within which would be embedded endless color variations, that being the end goal of relational colors and a light key. As we learn to integrate all these ideas, we essentially see that there is only the light, and if we miss the light, we have missed it all.